Q&A time, it's debate, and I want every one of you to ask a question before you can enjoy that beer in the exhibition hall. So if we start at the front and go along every row. No, seriously, um, questions. It's not often we have assembled on uh, the platform here such experts, so please make use of this. Gentleman in the middle there, please. If you could just give your name and the company as well, please. My name's Patrick Walters from Peel Ports. Um, am I allowed two questions? Um, and then I can go for my beer. Um, first question <laughs> I'll, um, could go to, um, I'll pick on Erin. Um, we've heard a lot about um, landside um, performance and landside connectivity and so on, and, and, and Neil talked about, um, said it's all about the cargo. I'd argue that um, that's the problem with um, our industry and our customers and our customers' customers is that it, it ceased to be all about the cargo. Um, and the, the question for Aaron is, is do you also see that the disconnect between what goes on on the ship side and what the liner shipping industry <coughs> has done um, with what's happened land side, which really we're dealing with old barges still, same old railways, same old trucks, um, and it's a, it's a that space has now become occupied by freight forwarders, by 3PLs, um, not by the carriers. And is, is that why you've now taken an interest in landside and trying to connect up with the end users? Absolutely, absolutely. You see that, at least uh, speaking from, from the recent experience in Oslo, you see that that end user really sometimes struggles to be able to get for example, uh, their container out the gate after closing hours. And they never had an, a, a path into the terminal to say, hey, maybe can you deliver this after closing hours? Or is there some additional service you're willing to offer that can allow my, my end or my warehousing more flexibility? Because it was always maybe stifled by some of these, these <coughs> third party logistics suppliers or even the carrier who doesn't even think that this could be something offer or something available that the customer <coughs> might like. At the same time, I do see some of the carriers starting to pick this up. I mean, one of the, the, the meetings I had recently was the carrier brought the terminal to the end customer and said, hey, how can we make the supply chain better? How can we work together? Of course, in the carrier's interest of keeping the volume on their vessel, but also in the end customer's uh, um, uh, interest to be able to to expand his uh, supply chain. Also, you see that they're under pressure as well. These distributors and the end uh, the end client is also looking for ways to optimize their their um, their warehousing and their distribution and their whole piece. So that typical end trucker is also starting to be a little bit. Um, not obsolete, but they're looking for guys that can, can pick up the container with an app, right? That can, can work uh, maybe off hours so they're not hitting traffic peaks. So you see all those dynamics filtering into that, which is great for a terminal operator starting to bring us closer to that customer. Thanks, can I just ask my second question? Um, and this is um, to, um, to Joyce. Um, do you see any parallels um, between the, the airline industry and, the, um, and our industry um, in terms of big ships and big planes? Because I read relatively recently that the sales of the A380 have started stagnating and people are actually putting into question um, the economics of um, operating large, very, very large planes. And I was just wondering whether you see any risk to the Port of Rotterdam in the future where we'll get to a point where we say, forget it, everything's got too big, let's reverse and let's go back to, let's say, medium-sized ships, 10,000, 13,000 TU, actually calling at ports where the cargo needs to go to rather than relying on a very, very small number of mega ports in Europe. Do you see that as a risk or, or can you continue scaling up, scaling up and, and always meet the challenges? Well, I must admit I have m not that big a knowledge of the, the airline industry, but what I do see is that, uh, and recently OECD also reported to, uh, on the bigger vessels uh, and the alliances, um, that, uh, and I'm, I'm sharing with Neil here, uh, I dare not say that there will be an end to uh, ever bigger vessels, uh, but you see some hesitation for the, for the next step. And I think, uh, would that be a threat to Rotterdam? that would mean that you have to change strategies again. And uh, we will always do that as 
and your view here in the market will also change uh, with the circumstances. So I don't see that you would uh, uh, have lent less uh, of a beneficial position in that respect. But uh, um, then you would adapt uh, your strategies again. Uh, at least we are still within uh, a large, uh, in the center of a large European market. So there I see, uh, always see opportunities. But you have to adapt. And what I think you can see from airline industry, that you have to adapt ever faster while uh, uh, the world around it is digitalizing because uh, the travel agencies are not there anymore and you see like EasyJets and Ryanairs. So uh, that might have uh, an effect on how you would uh, do your business. Th thank you. Uh, may maybe, uh, Neil, I know you mentioned in your presentation you didn't want to sort of predict how far the ship size may go, but uh, uh, you know, what's your, your view on a similar situation? Do, do you feel now that, that there is a a bit of a reluctance, given that this year there's been Evergreen, there's been Mitsubishi SK lines, uh, Maersk had just announced 19,200 tier. There still seems to be some momentum at the 20,000 tier you mark. So if, let's say, tomorrow somebody came out with 22,000, do you think then others would immediately follow that strategy? Well, I think um, we're talking here about the... 19, 20, 21,000 TU size is kind of a generic size, really, you know, because there's different ways of counting it and there's different assumptions about how many boxes and, you know, it all gets a bit technical, but, I mean, they're all 400 metres long and 23 boxes wide or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. so they're much of a muchness, really, at that kind of scale. Um, and it does seem to be the case at the moment that all the all the new orders are looking to sort of optimise what you can do within those physical parameters um, and everybody's sort of moving towards that we'll have to give it a name whatever it is the 20,000 you know <laughs> some acronym um, and yeah it seems like there is a reluctance to take the next step and I mean, it was interesting to hear Charles uh, Morel earlier on mm, saying you know yeah. there's no point going for 24,000 if you're going to do it you should go for 27 or 28,000 you know and then you're into a whole new league of complexity and also I think you're into a whole new, you do start to get to the point where you can't get into many ports and you have to call just once in Europe and once in Asia and so you're into a massive hub and spoke network, mm -hmm. you know, a completely different way of operating, you know, it's that, it does seem like that next change if it does come would be a very substantial step change in many different ways and I think that combined with the acceptance that it's having a big impact on ports already. Must be making lines, you know, be a bit cautious about this now because, you know, the the ports have been pretty good so far and have said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll adapt, we'll invest, we'll cope. They've put on a brave face, but I think there does come to a point where the ports have, are, are going to start to say, look, you know, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. It's getting far too expensive, far too difficult, and you know, if you build any bigger, you really will be in trouble. And, and getting back to you know, the, the, the question that Patrick raises, let's don't, don't forget the cargo. You know, here we're talking about ships again now, aren't we? <laughs> you, know, we, we you seem to get, we get back on ships all the time, don't we? And, and we don't talk enough about the cargo. Yeah. I don't know the answer, uh, answer myself, but there does, seem, does not seem to be a limit on, on how big you can build a container ship, really. But yeah. is there a limit on how big you can build a crane? Does, does a crane become so heavy? Does it become so high? Can you build one wider? Well, I mean, you know, what's the technology on the crane front? I don't know. And that's the other thing, really. It's the, you know, the, the other big thing holding back uh, a move to an even bigger ship is productivity in ports. Um, because, the, you know, the amount of time being spent in port by the big ships, you know, at the 18, 20,000 uh, band is already forming a, a much bigger proportion of the round voyage of the 77 mm. days or whatever, mm. say for an Asia Europe. You know, it used to be, what is it, what is it, 12, 13, 14 yeah, days in yeah, port, yeah, now it's yeah. 20, 21. So in percentage terms, the amount of time spent in port is getting bigger and bigger. And if you upsize again, without a revolution in handling technology, mm. then your ships will be spending, you know, 30 days in port on a, on a 77 day round voyage. So you'd have to steam faster to, Otherwise, you'll need more ships in the streams. So, you know, again, the whole network question gets thrown up in the air. And, it, and so, 
yeah, poor productivity mm -hmm. is, is, an, is another factor holding it back, I think. And, and the last factor holding it back is filling the ships. It's, you know, the, it's back to the same old issue that if you, if you upscale to a 25,000 TEU ship, how are you going to fill it? Well, you've got to form an even bigger alliance. Or you cut the strings. Well, uh, yeah, reduce yeah, the frequency yeah, yeah. so you get yeah, even yeah, bigger yeah, peaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you've got to find a way yeah. to fill the ship. You probably can't go to bigger alliances because the regulatory authorities would say, mm. no way. So, yeah, you've got to reduce frequency. And then, you, you know, is the shipper happy with even less frequency? No. Nope. No. So I think there are a lot of you know, really serious obstacles to go beyond the, the current, um, current level. But uh, who knows? While we've been sitting up here, maybe there's been an <laughs> announcement of an order of 12, 25,000 TU ships. We'll, we shall we'll see. see when we go for our drink. We shall see. <laughs> uh, do any other panellists want to comment on, on that issue about uh, how big the ships can go and, and so on? Andrew, do you want to make a comment on that? <coughs> Have you, do you cover the airline industry as well? Have you noticed anything... Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, you know, we, do, we do a huge amount in the airline industry as well. I mean, I think there are parallels between the sectors. I mean, maybe, you know, coming to that, I mean, I suppose the, the, the sort of the, 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 the observation I would make that, that sort of perhaps links the two sectors is that um, over the last five or six years, we've, we've been through the recession. We've been through the downside case, the downside performance of the industry that bankers like me spend all our time worrying about. Um, I've seen lots of charts today with sort of arrows of compound annual growth rate doing this. The, 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 I knew I had a good chart, and I was actually thinking about well, what happened in 2008-9, because that's, that's actually you know, the drop. That's the year I'm focused in as a, as a lender. Um, and we've been through that recession, and we've been through the performance. And what we've seen is that the airport sector and the ports and terminal operator sector have performed robustly. Have performed robustly. Um, and, and so that, that is what is then driving sort of capital, global capital, wanting to kind of reallocate into this sector away from collateralized loan obligations secured on US purport, yada, yada, where everyone's, um, which was just you know, at the heart of the financial crisis. So, you know, I, I do see that, that quite strongly. What I would also say, I mean, the note of caution is that that's been quite a brutal process in um, disaggregating the winners and the losers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we see that very much in the airport sector. Uh, we do see that in this port sector, you know, in this sector as well. Um, it really has been quite ruthless at, at showing that. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Thanks, uh, James Frost again for Mr. Davidson. Um, that uh, chart you showed um, where the big ships are going was uh, North America was sort of conspicuous by its absence. I wonder if you could comment on that, uh, especially um, when do you think the big ships will show up on the east coast of North America? I think the biggest one so far is 10,000 TEU plus. So you, you, did you say North America? Yes. Yeah. I know this is TOC Europe, but what, 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 I sort of feel duty bound to ask that question. Okay. Well, one thing we haven't talked about today at all, funny enough, is the new Panama Canal, but maybe uh, Neil could give some sort of comment on that. Yes, I mean, that, that slide was deliberately just focused on the sort of ports serving, you know, north-south trade, so the, you know, uh, Americas and, and Africa uh, in particular. So uh, it wasn't, wasn't an oversight to leave out North America, but, uh, yeah, it's a, a very valid question, particularly uh, given the uh, expansion of the canal. So, you know, the size of the ships, I think, it will, it will upsize when the canal opens, um, uh, the expanded canal opens. Um, because there are uh, at least three or four ports on the East Coast you know, capable of handling the bigger ships, or there will be. Um, and I think that the, uh, you know, the opportunity to move from 5,000 TEU ships to 8 or 9 or 10,000 TEU ships, you know, the economics of that will be pretty uh, attractive to any, uh, any carrier. So I think you would certainly see um, a move towards you know, 8 to 10,000 coming on all water services through, through the canal. Um, on the um, sewage route, I think uh, the ships are more like six or 7,000 TU at the moment, yeah, John. I, th I think there might be one string that is uh, uh, towards the eight and a half to yeah. nine. Uh, yeah. I think Merce Lime may have put a string in there of that size. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there may not be so much change on the, on the sewage route, but certainly the opportunity of the expanded canal, you know, uh, that, that will be taken advantage of, yes. 
Thank you for the question. Any, any, any further questions? Gentlemen here, please. El Kitani from uh, CMA CGM. Thank you very much to all the speakers for their uh, very interesting presentation. Um, Neil uh, highlighted very clearly that uh, in the uh, in this uh, in this uh, new uh, sorry in this uh, uh, no sorry <laughs> and these uh, big challenges we have this sorry for this uh, big uh, vessel. Uh, there will be uh, there is already a big uh, alliances, and uh, there will be in the near future some uh, consolidation in the uh, between the uh, terminals. My question will be addressed to uh, the port authority of uh, Marseille Force. Uh, Monica, can you uh, comment please on this uh, on this uh, topic, because you are really on the day-to-day uh, -day -to -day business, and if it this will be happen uh, very soon. What will be the, uh, the new role of the port authorities as the regulator between the, the op terminal operators? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the new role of port authorities in France uh, started uh, in May 2011 when the port reform law was implemented. It meant for port authorities to transfer over to private terminal operators um, their personnel the uh, crane drivers, the maintenance teams, and it meant for port authorities, for French port authorities, to sell their gantry cranes and to sell their shore cranes over to private parties. So the port of Marseille Foss, just like any French port, is now operating according to the European standard, meaning we have private terminal operators that are working on their terminals, uh, and this in the scope of concessions and they are at home in their terminals. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have two new terminals in, uh, in FOSS um, that are currently uh, capable and, and um, hosting uh, large ships. So we, we have 14,000 TU ships regularly each week. Uh, we, we can accommodate larger, even larger ships. Uh, so um, for us, there, the, on, on FOSS container terminals, uh, there are two private operators. Uh, one uh, is um, uh, CR Terminal, um, which belongs to uh, TIL, AP, Moller, and Costco. And the other one, Port Synergy, belongs to um, Terminal Link, China Merchants Holding, and Dubai Ports World. And should those private terminal operators, at the end of the day, uh, want to uh, somehow organize their back office or whatever, it will be up to them to do that because they are at home on their terminals. So I don't know whether I have replied to, to your question or if you want some additional clarifications. <laughs> ah, so there is another question behind the question then. Please go ahead. <laughs> Just wait for the microphone. So. Yeah, uh, I can understand from your answer that uh, you, uh, you stay a little bit far away from this uh, mail and you let the terminal operator to, uh, to make a relevance between, uh, between themselves. Um, if tomorrow this will happen, there will be one terminal operator in, in the port, right? Uh, well, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, um, as a port authority, we make sure that um, the contracts from each terminal operators between the port terminal operators and the port authority are, are respected. And we make sure that we create the right tools because uh, we have to take care of the infrastructure. We have to dredge if necessary. We ha we, and, and they take care of all the superstructure uh, investments. But then, if they want to cooperate, those are private companies um, if they want to cooperate, it means that there's a reason for that and that there's a benefit at the end of the day. Um, I mean, how could, how could we uh, stop them from cooperating? Because if cooperation at the end of the day means a better service to the customer, a better service to the shipping line, a better service to the shippers, 
why, why would we say it's not possible? But um, honestly, I mean, um, I doubt whether we'll be facing this type of situation uh, whereby 100% cooperation uh, would be uh, the solution. Maybe there could be solutions whereby um, having such a key length. Currently today on FOSS container terminals, we have uh, 800 meters for Sea Yard, we have 1,400 meters for, Euro for, uh, for Port Synergy, and in between we have a sort of no man's land. Which means that today, if they want to cooperate, technically speaking, they cannot. If, for example, one has a large ship and needs equipment from the other terminal, today this is not possible because we cannot transfer a gantry crane from one terminal to the other. In our investment plan, starting from, this, uh, from last year, 2014-2018, we intend to dredge on this, on this uh, area that is of about five, uh, three or 400 meters and make sure that we prepare the, 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 uh, the place for the terminal operators if they wish to cooperate, technically speaking. But this, this, will, this will be for the benefit of course, uh, of these terminal operators and of the uh, shipping lines that will be using the, 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 these uh, facilities. Okay, thank you very much. That okay. means uh, for you, the uh, terminal uh, alliances will be not for, uh, for tomorrow. It will still take time uh, till we see uh, these, uh, let's say, shipping line alliances uh, uh, succeeding for another four or five years or, or, or what? Because uh, it, it, I remember very well, uh, let's say, four or five years ago, when we uh, started a CMICGM uh, joint service with, uh, with, with Maersk, and we were calling, uh, by the way, uh, Foss sur Mer. And, uh, you are still calling Foss sur Mer. Yeah, but not, with, <laughs> not with Maersk. And uh, at that time, we had to make either a double call or make a, 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 a transfer. And it was uh, really a very a nightmare, especially to our clients, and this is uh, bringing me now to the uh, uh, ten uh, uh, wish list of our uh, one of our clients who were discussing in the uh, previous conference, and to help them more, uh, we need more support from the from the uh, uh, terminal uh, operator. And uh, you, as a, uh, port authority, do you see that the uh, the port alliances is something which will happen uh, very uh, very soon? Well, this is a very difficult question because even if you look at the ship, uh, the, the uh, shipping companies' alliances, these alliances uh, are, are not 100% uh, operational. They, they're not supposed to, to discuss rates. Uh, they're not supposed to discuss surcharges or that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, aspect within uh, the, the alliances. The alliances, if, if I understand well, these alliances are supposed to be uh, technical alliances, operational alliances. This is exactly the question regarding terminal operators. Why shouldn't there be technical or operational alliances between them? If it's for the benefit of the productivity, quality of service for the end customers at the end of the day. You know, we have rules, we have regulations, and we have antitrust laws and so on and so forth. So this is where I believe that Alliances have some limits, and um, I don't see why there shouldn't be terminal alliances, as I said, but there should probably be, be also be some limits there. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists want to comment on the issue of uh, cooperation between ports or alliances <laughs> between terminal operators or anything like that? Well, I think what what can be said about the, uh, the idea is that there's a whole spectrum of possibilities. You know, from, from over here you have the possibility of two neighbouring terminal operators you know, talking to each other about how they do things and helping you know, learn. Mm. And then over here you have full-scale merger or acquisition of two you know, neighbouring terminals. Mm. Getting, mm. And then there's a whole range of, of you know, alliance activity up and down that spectrum. Um, and c clearly, the further you get up towards this end, the f closer you get towards competition authority and regulatory yeah. Yeah. questions, yeah. you know. So you have to find the right 
point along that spectrum according to the market conditions of mm. the, you know, the individual ports and, and the countries in, in involved. Yeah, in that respect, that there's nothing new to that because uh, terminal operators have been working together since, since ages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether yeah. it's sharing a spreader of a specific kind mm -hmm. or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exchanging uh, labor yeah, or yeah. just opening gate to, uh, a gate or, or to get a straddle carrier out. So the, the yeah. scheme of things and the, the range of cooperation maybe is, is sort of shifting. But sort of to yeah. move it along the spectrum yeah. this way more, yes, yeah. yes. Erin, have you got anything to say on that? Do you see an alliance maybe between the new Oslo terminal and then <laughs> terminal elsewhere actually, in Europe is helping your traffic? Actually, it's funny because the, uh, the main driver of, for the new concession in, in Oslo was that there was two terminal operators and they were competing and the market is not that big. So you see two terminal operators competing against each other and not actually ending up uh, developing or investing in CapEx to, to be able to, to automate or optimize the process because they're too busy competing. And in that case, they actually did form operational alliances. And there are some other small reports in Norway that are looking at it as well, sharing equipment, sharing labor, yes. sharing maintenance costs. Um, but the question of monopoly uh, and, and mm. monopolistic mm. tendencies also comes up. Yeah. And, and, and also, we're, we're pretty <laughs> smack in the middle of that discussion being the, the, the main import center for the country. Um, so on one hand, uh, I agree that, uh, that um, uh, you, know, you see these operational alliances. But again, if you're too small and you have too many players, you actually, as the end customer, benefit from somebody who's actually going to come in and put some capex in instead of just continually uh, competing from each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I will take one last question if there is one. Otherwise, we'll just that gentleman there in the middle. And that has to be the final question of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Emre Spilan, uh, Mersin International Port from Turkey. I have a question to uh, Erin, uh, Port of Oslo. Yeah. Uh, Port Oslo, the same. <laughs> uh, you mentioned in the presentation that uh, you centralized the operations, the uh, planning, I mean. So, uh, do you have a plan, emergency plan, when the system went off? Uh, I mean, uh, the center, the headquarters, uh, cannot reach to uh, you uh, because you mentioned that they plan, the, they are planning your uh, operations and ordering you, uh, directing you the operations. And do you have an, any emergency plan uh, if the system went off? It's gonna. Uh, oh, contingency planning, backup planning. Backup yeah. planning, yeah. I mean, you, uh, when you uh, <coughs> work with the manual, uh, turn yes. to the manual system, what's it going to yeah. be? Exactly. So it is, it is a fine line. Thank so you. basically how we're, we're set up today, um, our, our global logistics center is doing not only the planning, but the dispatching. And the planning, to some extent, is, is pre-planning. So that's not necessarily so affected by, uh, by latency or contingency or backup, but the execution is. You can imagine all of a sudden if we lose internet connection and I cannot dispatch from, uh, from the key crane uh, from, from Turkey. So we, we do look at levels of redundancy. Uh, we also look at where our data center should be set up. Where is the highest uptime probability? And that's, for example, why we're we probably have our, uh, our core data center in, in Stockholm as opposed to uh, Turkey, although yet Turkey needs to be involved in the whole, the whole chain. So it does bring in a whole different aspect of uh, disaster recovery, of, of training, uh, and also how do I, how do I maximize my, my labor structure, give people just enough knowledge to be able to dispatch if we happen to be down for a few hours, but not necessarily build up a whole organization that is very costly and, and has uh, quite a bit of, of social or, or let's say, uh, uh, you know, people impact. So it is, it is also a learning process. Um, I, I can tell you the first week, two weeks of this, we probably spent just figuring out what the heck to call a container. All right, Turkey might call it a, a 40 foot to 20 foot, is it, a, is it a unit, is it a box, is it a can, is it a, what the heck is it? And having a Turk speaking English and a Norwegian trying to speak English over the radio, that, that probably took two weeks <laughs> to just to figure out. Um, 
So you have, you have not only that type of challenge with it, but you do have the contingency and, and backups, which um, you can also spend days and days talking about all the different scenarios and lines that could be cut in terms of, of how, your, uh, how your redundancy package is going to be set up. And so far, we've probably had two or three cases for maximum 30, 45 minutes where we've been in that situation. So we continue to look at different backup methods. We continue to look at where the network should be, where the server should be hosted. Also, we're probably going to do all our gate exception management as well. So in there, you're talking about lots of data, lots of streaming video. So how can we, how can we make it redundant um, based on our locations, based on the technology provided, and uh, of course, based on the people? OK, thank you. Well, it's been a very interesting, very informative session. Please put your hands together and thank all of our panelists for this afternoon. Thank you very much.